underneath the streets of London. An army of more than 10,000 engineers is building a brand new railway. Crossrail. Costing almost 15 billion pounds, it's the biggest construction project in Europe. You need to get out of the way here because trains are going to start coming through. One of the most complex challenges, building the train tunnels that will pass underneath the River Thames. This water is surrounding the whole tunnel all the way up and through. It's tougher than anyone imagined. This water is just coming through because our, our ceiling isn't working the way it's designed to work. This job is going to be a bucket of spiders. This is the inside story of the engineers building London's new underground. The Thames. The original superhighway that allowed London to grow. Today, a crucial new artery is taking shape that must pass right beneath this waterway. Crossrail, a 120 kilometer railway connecting Reading and Heathrow Airport in the west to London's major train stations, shopping districts, the square mile and the booming East End. It's due to open in 2018. The train tunnels for Crossrail need to pass underwater at two key points. They must go under the Royal Docks at Custom House and under the River Thames near Woolwich. In their heyday, the Royal Docks were the largest enclosed docks in the world. Much of the old infrastructure remains in place today, including an old Victorian passageway, the Connaught Tunnel. The Connaught Tunnel runs underneath the water here. Linda Miller heads a team that is attempting to rebuild this old tunnel to make it suitable for modern high-speed trains. The mission for the Connaught Tunnel team is to turn a 135-year-old beautiful piece of Victorian architecture uh, to a state-of-the-art modern tunnel. The tunnel as it stands is too small for Crossrail's rolling stock to squeeze through. Well, I've been on some very exciting jobs. I've, I've been lucky enough to build a new space launch complex at Cape Canaveral, Florida and do tunnels in other beautiful cities, but I reckon this is my favorite job yet. I love the idea that we're bringing beautiful old heritage railroad back to life. The Connaught Tunnel was built in 1878. Steam trains once ran through here, shuttling passengers and freight to the ferry terminals at North Woolwich. You may just see the old coke deposits and the memories of the steam trains left above there. But actually what I see is a tunnel that's in cracking good condition, fantastically well built, you know, really built to last. Dismantling and rebuilding this robust underwater tunnel will be a complex job. The Connaught Tunnel is a single tunnel for most of its length except in the center, under the docks, where it splits into two. Linda's team must completely rebuild this section, creating a single, taller, deeper and wider tunnel tube, big enough for two cross-rail trains. The first job then 
was to start to deepen this tunnel. And you can see that's, that's just what we've done, cutting away and uncovering bricks that haven't seen the light in, in 130 years. This is Alex, and this is her patch, the, the work that needs going on here right in the, right in the heart of the job. And this is my first project that I'm working on, so I'm really lucky to have such an interesting project as my first job. We're currently right below the docks, and we're in the, one of the twin tunnels now. We need to turn it back into one tunnel because our new Crossrail trains aren't going to fit in. By the 1930s, the Royal Docks were some of the busiest docks in the world. Ocean-going ships delivered grain, meat and sugar to the UK from Australia and New Zealand. The vessels were so large that their keels often scraped the roof of the Connaught Tunnel that runs directly beneath the water. Engineers at the time were concerned that these boat strikes could cause disaster. So they removed part of the tunnel roof to lower the dock floor and sealed the tunnel from the waters above with steel rings. Linda's team needs to remove these rings, but a survey has revealed that there is a problem with the plan. It was always assumed that we could cut these cast steel rings out and replace them with rings that were slightly larger and that that would all be fine because we had a really good uh, level of cover above the, above the crown of this, of this old tunnel. So it was shock and dismay after we had our first divers clear away quite a lot of silt that was at the bottom of the docks and do a proper survey and find that actually we, we have no cover at all. The word we were worried about is, oh my gosh, as we're trying to cut these rings off of the crown of this roof and that much water is, is above us, uh, catastrophic inundation or the sluicing in, uncontrolled sluicing in of the, of the royal docks into this tunnel became quite the, quite the real, uh, well, t terror, really. With little or no soil separating the tunnel from the water above, removing the steel rings could cause a catastrophic breach. The only way to expand the tunnel safely is to seal off the passage with giant steel barriers called coffer dams, drain the water and rebuild the tunnel top down from inside this dry workspace. Oh my gosh, well when we started, when this job was originally conceived five years ago, we were never going to be in the water. There was no coffer dam, there were no marine divers involved, it was all going to be just safely and tidily done from within. And actually the fundamental plan w was broken. And then to go and visit with our neighbors and say, you know how for five years, eight years really, Crossrail's been telling you we're not gonna close this passage? We're gonna close the passage. Shutting off the waterway here could cause chaos. It's the only way river traffic can pass to and from the city's largest exhibition space, Excel, home to the annual London Boat Show. Linda's team needs to wait until the boats have left this year's show before closing the passage. They have a narrow time window before it must be open again for the next big maritime event, the defence show, when naval ships will need to get through. So we've only got six months to actually um, build this. Rebuilding this old tunnel won't be easy. But south of the river at Woolwich, crossrail engineers are gearing up for an even bigger challenge. They're about to start building two brand new sections of tunnel from scratch, passing underneath the River Thames. In charge of the operation is project manager Gus Scott. Boring under the Thames is a huge undertaking. Logistically, very challenging for us. It's got a lot of work ahead of us, but uh, looking forward to, to getting it finished. The new train tunnels will connect North and South London together, but digging them through the earth beneath the river won't be easy. The ground is made up of sands and chalk, which hold water. The tunnelers will face a constant battle to keep the water at bay as they dig. 
Excavating these tunnels carries the highest risk of flooding of the entire Crossrail project. So to dig the tunnels, they need an extraordinary machine. Wow. Take that. It's been built at this factory in Germany. It's probably the largest piece of rotating equipment I'll ever be involved in in my career. It's the scale of it all, you know, it just plays back to everything I really was interested in and in getting into this career, playing with big boys' toys, and it doesn't get any bigger than this. This is Mary, a gigantic tunnel boring machine. She cost 11 million pounds and is specially designed to dig under the River Thames. Boring under the Thames, it, it really is high risk, but it's all about really knowing the ground conditions and making sure you, you select the best equipment on the market. And this, this is world class. It's like a thousand ton factory that will go under the Thames. The tunnel boring machine, or TBM, has sharp cutters in a huge rotating wheel that scrape at the earth like a drill. Behind this cutter head, an enclosed steel cage supports the earth and creates a safe area for miners to build a concrete ring. Seven precast segments make up each ring. A wedge-shaped keystone locks them in place. Once a ring is complete, hydraulic rams push the machine further forward into the ground. Every metre and a half they advance, they can build another ring. In perfect conditions, this digging demon can build up to 18 rings a day, leaving a watertight, tube-shaped train tunnel in its wake. This is designed really to do a long average 27 metres a day. We hope generally on average, allowing for maintenance, we're doing about 100 metres a week. Mary's cutter head is over seven metres across so that she can dig a tunnel wide enough for the new trains. Her teeth are made of tungsten carbide, tough enough to scrape away the chalks and flints. Once underground, a crew of highly skilled workers will keep Mary running 24 hours a day. You know, the 60 men who work on these machines the crews that run these are a very close-knit group, all worked together before. These tunnelers do it for their whole careers. So it's still a very kind of like uh, manual process, isn't it? Even though it's all automated, you're still relying on the skill of the, of the Absolutely. operator. Absolutely. Absolutely. The responsibility of the operator is, is on a high level. Mary's cutter head will dig through several areas of high water pressure under the Thames. If any of her tungsten carbide teeth break, workers will have to pass through an airlocked chamber to repair them. So it's like a submarine that goes underground, this yeah. uh, type of machine. Yeah. Should paint it, you should paint it yellow. Yeah, yeah, yeah yellow submarine. <laughs> yeah. Mary is one of eight tunnel digging machines being built at this factory for the Crossrail project. Each one is shipped to London like a giant jigsaw puzzle in more than 50 pieces. Workers must reassemble these kits before digging can begin. At this work site just east of Canary Wharf, a team is preparing to put the most critical piece of this tunneling machine in place. They must lift the enormous cutting wheel and connect it to the rest of the machine. Lift manager Lee Bartley is on site to make sure nothing goes wrong. The TBM itself is made up of many, many uh, different bits and that we've, we've, uh, we've had to sort of put together about something in the region of uh, 70, 80 pieces to get to that stage now. This is the essential part of the tunnel boring machine. This is the face, this is what does the actual tunneling process. Without this, nothing. It is vital that this is right. The cutter head weighs 62 tonnes 
and needs two cranes to raise it up into place. It's critical their movements are in sync or the heavy load could swing out of control. Commanding the operators is banksman Claire Halliwell. I was in the armed forces for seven and a half years, so um, this is pretty much similar to what I used to do. We used to build bridges and go in the back of tanks. We're used to dealing with big lifts. Okay, you ready? Just take it up that angle and then pull and trap back and even jig back and take away as well. Okay. Stop them both and then go and talk to them both and so they're clear with what you want to do. Can you guys stop ready to continue ready to go on here? The boys are ready for the timber, we're ready to go in. Let's start bringing this one down. Well, well. Finally in there, and they're uh, all bolted up, so very pleased to say yes, another one in and successful. Crossrail have christened all eight of their tunnel boring machines with women's names, like ships. This one is called Elizabeth, after the Queen. The team launches Elizabeth by lowering her down a 35-metre hull. From here, she will begin an epic underground voyage to Farringdon. Her first port of call will be the newly constructed station at Canary Wharf. One stop east, back at the Royal Docks. Linda and structural engineer David Wilde are doing further research on the new plan to seal off the waterway above the Connaught Tunnel so they can rebuild it from the top down. The original engineer's drawings of the tunnel are held in the archives at the Museum of London Docklands. So there it is, there's a Victoria Dock. This is going to be the Albert Dock when it's done, isn't it? But at this time, it's actually called the proposed extension. Proposed That's it. extension. So they haven't actually decided on the name, funnily enough. Well, I have to say, I've never started a job where I've had to go back and look at uh, the, the original drawings, 135-year-old drawings, uh, drawings yeah. there. We've been presented with the same problems as the original construction. Basically, a lot of it's to do with water and how you actually uh, build something with all the water around it. Linda and David are encouraged to see that their new plan for rebuilding the tunnel mirrors the techniques used by the engineers who originally built it. Existing dam, see that's its history repeating itself there. This one is quite good insofar as I believe it shows the open cut, the mm. way it was excavated and installed in the, in the first instance. What they would have done is instead of tunneling underneath the ground, they've actually excavated and around the profile and then installed the tunnel in, in there. So they built it from the top downwards effectively. The plan was that we were going to enlarge the Connaught Tunnel from within, and we were never going to need to put cofferdams down and, and block off the passageway. Uh, but now on reflection and, and looking back at these drawings and looking at the two twin wall cofferdams standing there, 
with 1872, 1874 written in the corner of the drawings. I, I, th I think it was meant to be. The London Boat Show is now over. As the last luxury yachts cruise out of the docks, the narrow window of opportunity opens for Linda's team. They can now close the passage directly above the tunnel. They must reopen it again in time for Navy ships to get to the defense show in just seven months' time. Working with XL to try and fit this in between their London boat show and the defense show coming in September, we'll try and quickly get in here, do open heart surgery on this, on this tunnel from the top, rebuild it into a larger tunnel, and get out of here by the time the defense show comes. It's hard work. With the clock ticking, Linda's team wastes no time draining the water. As they pump the last drops out, a specialist team moves in. Um, well, we're here today really uh, just as part of the welfare. Uh, obviously there could be some fish trapped in between the coffer dams and there's an opportunity arised whereby the water's at a level where we can sweep round with a seine net and basically see if there's anything in there that needs rescuing. Years ago, this river used to have salmon, sea trout, sturgeon running through it. There is always a possibility with, with the water getting cleaner that those fish could have come back and you know you might pick something up strange like that in here so uh, you never say never. That is as low as it's going to go I think. I'm going to go down in the cage with it because I think it'll be easier to get out. I'll meet you at the bottom of the steps though. Okay. Opens inwards. You ready? Yep. You gonna get in as well? Um, I will do once you're in. Ooh, ooh, ooh. It's like your mullet, isn't it? Yeah. Ooh. Fortunately, we've got lots of muck and debris. Well, there's a handful of small, small fish. Oh. So we haven't got many there because a lot of them were these real small fellas here which went through the net and they're a, they're a type of scad and then we've got a sprat, I think that's juvenile bass which is, will grow up to be the sea bass that you find in the restaurants and then somewhere in here we've got a young a baby young bronze bream, which is called a skimmer. They release the rescued fish into the open dock. I should be happy in their new home now. So away they go. South of the river, near Woolwich, Gus's team is putting together the giant jigsaw puzzle that has arrived from Germany. Mary, the 11 million pound tunneling machine that will dig Crossrail's new Thames tunnel. The big thing is how huge these bits are, you know, the 40 tonnes, 35 tonnes here, 10 tonnes, 15 tonne bits, all, all built together to make this 1,000 tonne factory. The team will guide Mary north, under the river, from here. Everyone's chomping at the bit to get a going on. This year is a beautiful machine, she is. On the team is Peter Birmingham. He's been tunnelling for 50 years and turned 70 today. Oh, thank you very much. That's it. Help yourself, please. Digging Crossrail's Thames Tunnel will be Peter's final project before retiring. Peter's two sons, Dan and Robert, are working shoulder to shoulder with their dad, building the Crossrail Tunnels. I've spent three minutes of my life making him, and I've spent three minutes of my life making him. Uh, Mum, doesn't, Mum doesn't reckon it was that long. Have you? <laughs> There's been three really significant tunnelling projects. There's been the Channel Tunnel, the Jubilee Line Extension, and now Crossrail and he's been sort of like intricately involved in all three of those, you know, that's a, that's, that's a hell of a thing to leave. When these new tunnels are finished, 
Peter will have tunnelled under the Thames ten times. I don't think anybody in history has done that. It'll be a long time before anybody else does. Son of Irish immigrants, you know, you were, you were a navvy, and uh, this is a, a navvy becoming a, a highly respected professional. I got here. Tunnelling was very different when Peter first started out. I first started tunnelling in 1964 on the Victoria Line. Hand-driven tunnel, all by hand, with cloth caps and no helmets or protective clothing at that time. The machinery wasn't that powerful. Most of it was hand tools. I cannot believe it was in my time. It looked like walking back on Victorian times, you know. We've come so far with the equipment we've got down there now. Absolutely fantastic. There is a special breed of tunnel guys. You can't be normal if you go underground, can you? I mean, that's, you know, you're living in the bowels of the earth. But uh, it's a proud industry to be in. And the technology is coming on so much and so fast, you know, to be able to go through ground that we, we, we never thought possible. It's incredible. With the cutter head in place, she's set for launch. It takes three days to push the 150-metre-long machine into the earth on the south bank of the Thames. 20 workers in two shifts will keep her drilling 24 hours a day through one and a half kilometres of boggy ground beneath the river. It will take eight months for the machine to resurface on the other side. One stop west at the Royal Docks. Linda's team has no time to lose. They have drained the dock, exposing the roof of the old Connaught Tunnel. They now have just six months left to completely rebuild this tunnel, reflood the dock, and reopen this passageway for ships. We've got, um, we've got lots of work fronts going on, so we're working in the tunnel, working in the dock. We've got all a team basically working together to try and achieve one goal. The team must complete a laundry list of challenges in a very short time. First task, remove the steel rings lining the twin tunnel section. Then, knock down the connecting wall to create a single, bigger passageway for cross-rail trains to run through. What you're able to see quite clearly here now that the docks are empty, you can see the cast steel barrel. The crossrail tunnel is going to be wider and, and rectangular and fit its haunches within the old tunnel. The team makes good progress removing the rings. But as they cut the steel away in this corner, they reveal a completely unexpected brick arch behind. That's a problem. The new tunnel is supposed to fit inside this arch, but it hangs too low for the new tunnel to fit in. That's got to be the move. Linda and the team can't just remove the arch, because it could be supporting the docks above. You're not going to be able to take a section out of this and still be able to hold on to your arch in effect. Very unlikely. Unlikely. Is it the same on the other side? Yeah, but well, we don't know how far. All the rings they've taken out so far, we've got the reduced dimension. All right. Yeah. So this is yet another time when this tunnel shows us uh, new mysteries. This job actually started construction a year ahead of when everyone said that it needed to. And it was because a predecessor of mine said, it's going to be a bucket of spiders. And oh my goodness, have we used every bit of that. And now we're staring at the end date that we never thought that we would need to be worried about. Linda and the team are already facing a very tight deadline. They can't afford this new delay. They need to find out as quickly as possible if the arch is holding the docks above or if it's safe for them to remove it. And somebody's going to go get central engineering to, to start having a look, the chief geotech. 
and I want them to hear about it now so when they show up at the meeting on Friday they'll already have had a chance to kind of think it through, maybe look up some information on it to either, to either say it's going to work or it's not going to work. One stop east at Woolwich. The Thames tunneling machine has started burrowing her way underneath the river. Engineers have locked the first few hundred concrete panels that form the walls of the tunnel in place. They have over a thousand more to go. It is hard to get lost down there because there's only one way and one out, but I'll tell you something right now, if the lights went off and it was pitch black in here, you'd have a hard time finding your way about. At key points, Dan's team needs to drill through the panels to create cross passages, connecting the east and westbound train tunnels together. Now, well, initially we're going to break these out. We'll obviously uh, stitch drill around the, the, the area where it needs to, then break it out and then just uh, have a backhoe digging out and a sprayed concrete lining and so on. The panels hold back huge amounts of groundwater. The team must battle this water before they drill through them. Got two and a half bar of water pressure behind us at this point. So we need to grout the ground behind, seal off any water before we open up. These things here are valves, and obviously we'll pump grout through these valves behind the back of the ring uh, and into the uh, open ground. This water is surrounding the whole tunnel all the way up and through. We can try and dewater it, but there's so much it'll take forever. So uh, what we do is just seal up the fissures in the ground and push it away from the area that we're going to tunnel through. It's a great challenge. Tunnelling under the Thames has been a great British obsession for hundreds of years. The first tunnel ever built beneath a river anywhere in the world was the Thames Tunnel built by Mark Brunel and his son, Isambard Kingdom Brunel. This tunnel was a twin-track passage designed for horse-drawn vehicles. It still exists today and carries rail traffic. To build it, Mark Brunel designed a revolutionary invention. Called a tunnel shield, it was an iron cage protecting 36 miners excavating clay by hand at the digging face. As the men dug further, enormous screws inched the structure forward. Behind, bricklayers shored up the exposed tunnel walls. Two shifts of men drove the tunnel forward 16 hours a day. It took them 16 years to dig from one bank to the other, a distance of just a quarter of a mile. Brunel's Thames Tunnel opened in 1843, initially as a pedestrian walkway. More than one million people, half the population of London, visited this subterranean wonder within the first three months of its opening. A modified version of Brunel's shield was later used to excavate the London Underground. Today, the machines digging Crossrail's Thames tunnels are souped-up versions of his design. TBM's been around, well, his and Bar King and Brunel's dad invented them, didn't he, really? The first shields, the hand shields. That's just advanced from there. It was very difficult to tunnel through here. Every time you go under, technology makes it just that bit easier. It always moves on. But you do have a lot of heavy kit in close quarters. No such thing as a small hurt. You make a mistake on here, there's no such thing as a small error. It, it, the impact is quite severe, so you've got to get it right, yeah. It takes the driver and miner less than an hour to install each of the concrete rings that keep the water at bay. Pipes and pumps suck the clay slurry away from the digging face as they advance. We, we mark every ring. 
numbered based on the first ring in the tunnel is ring number one. This is actually 1,232, but on that ring I managed to drop the number so it's under the segment feeder somewhere. It'll come out the back, it's no problem, but uh, I don't know whether I should improvise a number one or... It's a convincing number one, I think. That'll do me. I don't know, maybe this is just pride of project or whatever, but of all the projects, this is one I prefer to be on. You know, it's the most unique. And uh, we're going under the river, so it's a bit of a, a bit of a pride about it, so there is. A rubber seal surrounds each concrete panel. The crew must check the seals for punctures and grease them before bolting the panels together to make sure the tunnel walls are watertight. Basically, this whole tunnel we were mining under the water table. We never mine above water. And we were in water bearing strata as well. So it's all around us right now, but the sealing systems of the ring, the design of the ring means that we keep it out. The final layer of protection, a foam band that will expand on contact with water to block any leaks. Even with all this technology, no tunnel is ever 100% watertight. We've got a little bit of water coming through there. If there's nothing there to, to, to stop that coming through, obviously we'd have a very wet tunnel. Yeah, we need to keep an eye on it because uh, if it gets any worse, we'll make sure that we can come back and repair it. We know exactly where it's at uh, and do any remedial works that are necessary. Millions of people will be doing this in a couple of years' time. Let's just hope it's a bit less noisy and a bit less bumpy. That's our work done for the day. Uh, I've been in and seen see the lads. This guy's going to carry on for a few hours. It's my last shift here, so I'm on my way home there, up to sunny North Wales. North of the river at the Connaught Tunnel, Linda's team is back on track. Their survey revealed that the passageway's brickwork is strong enough for them to remove this low arch without risk of the whole tunnel caving in. In fact, Linda has discovered that the brickwork is unusually strong. The mortar between them is 100% full. There's no gaps here at all. It's a fantastic, fantastic job. And then the 135 years of earth pressure and water against it has sealed it up to where it be it's behaving more like stainless steel than it is brick and mortar. The strong mortar is now causing the latest problem for the team. They can't get the bricks out quickly enough. Just over a third of the way to go. To it's, uh, it's quite slow going, this brickwork. You know, I've seen brickwork like this taken down, and all you normally need to do is have a couple of stabs at the mortar, and that whole brick layer goes off. A couple more stabs at the mortar, and the next yeah. layer goes off. I know the men are taking a short break here now, but hand breaking out this 130 year old brick is just, well, it's just yeah, hard it's gonna work. It's going to take a while. I know they're working at night and day. I know they've got extra crews in, but there's not much time. Yeah. Linda's crew has just two weeks left before they must re flood the dock. They are behind schedule. Here we are in the last throws of the last couple of weeks before we put the water back in. We couldn't be throwing more into it than this. We're all doing shifts, covering each other, and doing everything we can to try and get it all done for the deadline date next weekend. September 2nd is not that far away, and we're going to see military ships that are going to be looking at us over our coffer dams unless we get out of the water. Underneath the river at Woolwich, the Thames Tunnel boring machine is nearly halfway through her long drive to the northern bank. Each six metres the tunnel advances, the crew must extend the rails for locomotives and the pipes that carry the waste away from the digging face. A team of nine 
Working seven days on and four days off keep the machine moving. It's hard work, but it's an entry into a tunneling career. This is the first tunnel. Yeah. For me. Yeah. Uh, the <laughs> No matter how hard they work, the team and tunneling machine can only advance as fast as the chalk and flint is removed from the tunnel face. A three kilometer long network of pipes snaking under London transports the clay and slurry to this plant in Plumstead. If this facility goes down, tunneling grinds to a halt. This humble looking shed houses the pinch point of the entire operation. Whatever we excavate, the, the chalk, sands and gravels all get pumped back in slowly through this pipe. We take out all the larger particles through the trommel, through the descending unit, through the desilting unit. And then the waste slurry, everything that hasn't got anything over about half a millimetre, gets stored in a, a huge tank outside and then we, we pump it over into this room, the filter press room, where we've got six of these presses. The principle behind it is very simple. You know, basically to hold the slurry so you can squeeze the moisture out, recycle the water and, and be left with the cakes. I guess in a way, the simple things are the best ideas. Um, you know, we can do 40, 50 tonnes an hour here. Gus's team ships the cakes to Essex, where they are used to nourish grassland conservation areas. And you know, this really controls the advance rate of the TBM. If we can't get the materials out quick enough, then we can't advance. Two stops west, the tunnel boring machine called Elizabeth is homing in on Canary Wharf. Elizabeth has tunnelled nearly two kilometres through solid ground and must now hit a target, the newly built station box with millimetre precision. We're in the minus six level of the Canary Wharf box and we're just waiting on our first TBM to pop its head through for our first breakthrough. This is our first breakthrough on an existing structure. So for us, this is all about making sure that the machine is where it should be. Canary Wharf Station is a giant six-level box. With a garden, shops and restaurants on the upper floors. And the platforms deep below ground. Peter Main's team must drive their tunnel boring machine through the station's concrete walls, hitting a specially designed target. work and then one little hiccup it's only one decimal point you need to be out and it, it would be meters off on the other side of the station wall the tunneling crew put the final rings in place in charge is Scott Moss one of almost 200 young graduate engineers hoping to follow in Brunel's footsteps and join in the Great British burrowing obsession. I have to check the rings, make sure the rings are all intact, no damages to them. If it wasn't from the segments, there wouldn't be a tunnel wall. So uh, they are quite important in that respect. And it's mainly important that the segments get laid out in the right sequence. As we are excavating, I decide what orientation the next ring gets installed at. I only started at the beginning of March, so only two and a half months. So all is extremely new to me. I just hope I don't give him a wrong ring. <laughs> a tunneler's first breakthrough is an important rite of passage. It's the, the highlight of the job. Not only is it my first breakthrough, but it's this project's first breakthrough as well. Uh, we're in a massive occasion and we're just all hoping that it all goes well and we turn up at the right place at Canary Wharf. <laughs> the 
the noise you can hear is Elizabeth, our first TBM. She's currently boring her way through the concrete that will bring her into the Canary Wharf box. But with less than a metre to go, Elizabeth stops digging. There could be a dozen reasons for, for stopping cutting it. You know, it could be a belt issue, but we'll find out. Elizabeth has a conveyor belt stretching all the way up to the surface to carry away the excavated rock and soil. Today, of all days, this crucial link has broken. The belt has slipped. Elizabeth can't break through until it's fixed. Scott's shift is about to end. There will be no first breakthrough for the young engineer. The nice shift to get to claim the first breakthrough of this contract. Devastating, to be honest. They work into the night, trying to fix the belt on the other side of the wall. Can't do any more about it now. Just wait patiently. Very patiently. We're going to repair the conveyor for the rest of this night shift, and then we'll shove through between 7.30 and 8 tomorrow morning. The drawn-out fix is good news for Scott, who is now back on shift. Fortunately, it took nine hours. It's up and running now, so all is well in the end. We get the repairs overnight to the conveyor, and I'm looking forward to Elizabeth coming through. Scott's and Crossrail's first breakthrough is now just centimetres away. Scott gets the honour of being second man through. I was on the phone to my mum just as we broke through. A bit sad, I know, but she was happy for me. My very first one. They let me come out the head, one of the first ones, so uh, it was brilliant. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Ecstatic, to say the least. One stop east at the Royal Docks. Linda's team has been working around the clock to remove the protruding arch inside the Connaught Tunnel. They have just one day left to shore up its roof with steel and concrete before they must reflood this dock. This will be the final act in the second part of the play, and we're just waiting for the final sign off for the last four. The team had scheduled the concrete pour to start today at dawn, but there's a glitch. They need to add more steel to strengthen the roof. 6.30 this morning, the steel wasn't right, too narrow, so it was a mutually agreed decision to stop. This isn't going to work like it is. We need to get some more steel in there, some more rebar. We're here on the last day pouring concrete on the last minute of the last hour. This is a complete departure from the original scheme.
With the steel finally in place, the concrete pour begins. Eight hours behind schedule. Concrete has just started pumping, unfortunately, here at four, three o'clock in the afternoon rather than seven o'clock in the morning. Never a dull moment. The final push pays off, and water streams back into the area on time. There's one last challenge before boats can pass through here. Divers need to cut away the huge steel props that have been supporting the dock walls. OK, ready for me now. Roger, roger, main air's coming onto the diver. Okay. Anything underwater that needs to be done, we're here to offer our assistance. Okay. It's not easy sort of work. Imagine trying to go down there and work in completely black water. Okay, I'm in the water, gonna make my way to the jump. The divers need to use heat cutting tools to slice the props free. When that's done, they will then start pumping air into the prop, which will make it buoyant and should enable it to float to the surface. It'll be great to see the props come out, because that then gives us a uh, free passage for these battleships to come in, come through in September. We have committed to the Royal Navy and to Excel that we're going to make this passage free. Anytime you have divers down in the water doing hot cutting works, uh, it's just by its nature extremely hazardous, extremely perilous. One stop east at Woolwich, it's a big day for the Birmingham family. They are approaching the last few metres of their drive under the Thames. So at the moment we're just going to go into the uh, tunnel where TBM1 is actually uh, still mining. We're underneath the River Thames, nearly, nearly reached breakthrough point. It took the Brunels 16 years to complete the first Thames Tunnel. Peter and Dan Birmingham have built theirs in just over eight months. You know, we're going to break through into the, the new uh, reception chamber at North Woolwich. We're all relieved to get through. It's, not, it's always nice to see the light at the end of the tunnel. The Thames Tunnel Machine's cutting wheel is designed to work under high pressure when she's digging underwater. So just like a diver, she must depressurize in a chamber before she can come up for air. So this is where all the action's been. You can see here on the teeth how you've got the wear at different levels. You know, that's the full profile and you can see here that's worn all the way back there. Um, been through some tough flints and geology, but uh, yeah, made it. For lifelong tunneler Peter Birmingham, completing the Crossrail Thames Tunnel is the culmination of a 50-year career. No, this is my lot. And I retire and looking forward to that. 
my wife's got a nice little sports car, so we're going to talk about driving down to the Amalfi Coast in Italy and forget about tunnels, concentrate on an enjoyable retirement and with my wife and grandchildren right now. Oh, it's good. Time to go. Keep icing on. The tunnel may be finished, but this tunnelling machine's life isn't over. You know, try and keep it squirt at Crane, lads. Her components will be reused to build other tunnels around the world. Keep coming down. Keep coming down. <clears throat> Another 500 mil, Anthony. Keep lowering off. 200 mil. Keep coming. All stop. At the Royal Docks, the waterway above the Connaught Tunnel has finally reopened. Linda and the team have completed the tunnel, just in the nick of time. I can't believe you can see all the way through. No one's ever going to have been able to see that all the way through. Doesn't it look fantastic? I know, it's mad. And I can't believe it's finally done. It feels so good. Like we're directly below the dock right now, and you wouldn't know. I know. Below meters of water there above us. Oh my gosh, we were working like dogs, weren't we, 24 7? It couldn't have been closer. It couldn't have been closer. We've done it. A couple of years ago, when I was standing in the steel line structure, I had no idea, I couldn't even envisage what it would be like when we we're finished. It just seemed like we had so much work ahead of us, it's never, ever, ever going to end. For me to have it is my first job is, is amazing. I think I'm probably going to be disappointed at everything else I go to now. <laughs> This is the new Comet Tunnel for the next 120 years. So you need to get out of the way here because trains are going to start coming through. The new £15 billion railway is due to be open to the public by 2018. There's a huge amount of work still to do before a single train can run. Workers must gouge out space beneath the city's crowded streets for 10 enormous new stations. It's hard to imagine that in another five years, this will be teeming with passengers, there'll be swanky new trains coming through, and it will all be an architectural masterpiece. Building these structures will not only be a big engineering challenge. Beautiful, beautiful, looking more than good, looking brilliant. But it will also reveal lost secrets of London's past. It's exciting. This is one of the first times within this immediate area that we've actually found several skeletons together. 